The more I miss meetings, the more I miss drinking. And they call me Gratitude Brian all over the country because I always share gratitude and enthusiasm because the newcomer needs to hear that. What happened that clicked and changed everything for you? When I was 20 years old and I had been drinking alcoholically for six years already. I'm making $100,000 a year and I'm broke every week. Some people think of alcoholics as just homeless people. My life was just drinking, doing cocaine, gambling, and just being a complete menace to society. And now I'm 48 years old and I am destroyed from alcohol and I've just put my mother and son through three years of devastation bring them back to the detox again and this time I'll go to a halfway house take a guess what happens oh my god yeah. labeled a slow learner I always felt a little bit always different. felt like there was something wrong I'm with so me embarrassed wasn't ready to see myself I can't go any lower Don't sell yourself short I'm covering all those feelings everything was lifted at that moment this really wasn't about not drinking Hi, welcome to Crosstalk. I'm coming to you from South Florida. Crosstalk is the number one recovery podcast in the world. Actually, number one podcast of all time, anywhere and everywhere. You have to watch it. <laughs> Just kidding. Please follow, like, subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're really trying to send a message of hope and that recovery is possible no matter how low you've gone. We want to make this accessible to everyone. If you have any, um, you know, suggestions, if you have any comments, questions, you need help, you have a loved one who needs help, reach out. We, um, we want to help you, you know, that's why we're doing this. Uh, if, if you want to be on the podcast and you're in recovery, reach out, uh, whether you're in South Florida or in New York, that's the, that's the uh, requirement. Um, let us know. We uh, love to hear from you guys. Today, I have Brian. Thank you so much, Brian, for coming. You're welcome. So what we do on, on Crosstalk is we kind of go over, you know, your story and share what the journey's been like. What was it like before? How bad did it get? What did it look like? Um, and then what happened that clicked and changed everything for you? I've known you. I've known you for eight years, but you've been doing this for a little longer. And I know you've helped so many people. You helped me. You were always a smiling face for me when I first came down to Florida. So tell us how you did it. First of all, thanks for having me. This is a, an honor, you know, yeah. and any, any way I can possibly help somebody struggling or maybe not pick up a drink today, that's huge, you know? Yeah. And um, my sobriety date's March 29, 2011, so I have a little over 13 years sobriety. Amazing, and, you know? and you're not from Boston, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Worcester, but the yeah. accent is pretty distinctive, you yeah. know? And, um, and I love the format because um, that's really what I like to do is tell my story and, uh, and mainly about the recovery and how I was hopeless and now I'm not, you know? So, um, like I said, I'm from Massachusetts. The first time I drank, I was 14 years old. We went on a nice little family outing in Hampton Beach. We had a cottage on the ocean, and that was the first time I drank, and I went out and I drank way too much. Went back to the cottage. It was a couple families, you know, it was a big cottage, and um, I laid on the bed, and the bed started spinning, and I got up, and I threw up on my cousin on the floor, <laughs> and, I went, and I went out to the back porch, and I threw up till I was dry heaving. That night, I blacked out. And I woke up with a vicious hangover. And I did that for 34 years straight. You know what I mean? So did you have that feeling that a lot of people talk about that, you know, um, that, that um, feeling of like, this is it. This is what you want to do. Like, why, why did you choose to drink or use again, you know, after you threw up on your cousin on the porch, you blacked out, you know, what made you say, okay, this sounds fun. I'm going to do it again. And, and, and you know, that next morning I felt so bad. And I remember I was sitting on the boardwalk on the steps of the casino boardwalk in Hampton beach. And, um, all of a sudden a seagull right on my pants. Right. And uh. I'm there like, so I'm hanging, I'm hung over. I feel worse than I've ever felt in my life. And I got this big stain on my pants. I'm there like, can it get any worse? So, you know, I felt awful that next day. And um, I don't know, you know, if it was a week or a, two weeks or a month later when I started drinking again. But, you know, this was back in the late 70s. And um, then it kinda, I kind of waited until I got into high school. You know, I was like a you know, junior. And then we started drinking every weekend. 
And it was just like every time it was drinking to black out, you know, drinking to throw up, drinking to, for these fights and whatever it was, you know, because um, it was just a wild time, you know, and it, it was fun. You know, every, we all had a great time. Right, right. And um, so f what ended up happening was all of a sudden I was 20 years old and I had been drinking alcoholically for six years already, you know, like already with like double digit blackouts, double, you know, just horrible. You know, I remember I was staying in, a, I had these two older aunts and an uncle, none of them ever got married, and they were living near where I used to hang around. And I got so drunk, I was like 16 years old, and I fell down and I cut my hand open, Oof. right? And it was gushing blood, and they brought me back to my two aunts and uncle in a shopping cart and rang the bell and left. This was like, I was like 16 years old. I didn't even have a license yet. So they opened the door. They're like in their 60s and 70s. And like I was their precious nephew. And the next morning, I'm in pajamas. They had changed me. And they said, who were them people that did that to you? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, it, but that's just the way it, it went. So, you know, and then, um, so like I said, so now I'm out of high school. I got a union job in construction. And um, the construction workers back then just drank a lot, you know. So it was just... And that's the way, you know, the family dynamics were, you know, all holidays, you know, driving in the car, mom and dad drinking, you know, you know, that's just the way it was, you know. Right. And um, so then I got the job in the union and, uh, you know, it was a great job and I was drinking all the time. And plus I had started doing cocaine too, you know, so the combination of them, always drinking first. And then the other thing, so now I'm, I'm working in my 20s and I, you know, I got married, I was 22, had a son and um. But I'm broke at the end of the, every week, you know what I mean? I'm going out after work, and it's just, it just, that's just the way I live my life, you know what I mean? Right. You know, it was, was your vicious. wife a drinker as she well? She drank a little bit, not like I did, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, you know, when we got divorced after three years of marriage, I'm mean, there like, wow, how could she do this to me? <laughs> it took a long time to realize it was all me, you right. know? Right, right. And, um... So then, you know, and, I, and I'm a boss in this company, and I got like 20 guys working for me, and I'm drinking at lunchtime, and it's just, that's the way I live my life. So all of a sudden, now I'm 30 years old. Yeah. And I'm drinking like five days a week. I'm drinking at lunch. I'm, I'm blacking out on the weekends. You know, I probably blacked out a, over a thousand times in my lifetime. It's vicious, but right. that's just my, my history. And, um, and there were no consequences in well, your you know, 20s, like, like DUIs well, what, or... A couple, like, so I'm, I'm living in this big city, and I have one of the sergeants in the police force is working as a full-time union laborer and a full-time police officer. So just one quick story. Yeah. I was like, um, you know, I don't know. It, my son was like two or three, and we had just got divorced. It was Father's Day, and um, she wouldn't let me see him. Probably a good reason, whatever. So I go on and get drunk. I'm in the bar room, and I'm falling off the bar stool at like 6 o'clock at night. My elbows are bleeding, my knees are bleeding, and I got an old LTD station wagon with the fake wood on the side. Oh, the God, thing, I remember right? this. <laughs> and it was a boat. So I'm driving, it, and it, it, the sun's still out, and I'm probably like, I am hammered, right? They tried to take the keys, and I just left, you know. no, You never wanted to ride. You always ended up driving drunk. I drove drunk so many times, and thank God I never, you know, injured anybody. Oh, well, me too, and you I know. say that all the time. I should be in jail. Right. For how many times I've driven drunk, the fact that I haven't hurt someone right. or taken someone's life or take or hurt my own right. self is a, a miracle. Right. That's so, why it's so easy for me to believe in a higher power, right? right? So that so now I'm driving down like a side road, you know, it's like a 30 mile an hour speed limit and I'm speeding and then there's a, a trade high school and it's like a 90 degree turn and I didn't make the turn and I went up on the median and I hit the pole and I hit it so hard that I had a huge bruise on my arm mm. and I knocked the battery off the terminals. So now I'm in the middle of the city right near the police department and Worcester's a big city. Mm. And I try start and it's starting and it won't start. I go, I'll just walk home. So an alcoholic, I walked about 20 sit ups and I said, no, I'm gonna go back and get this thing going, right? Yeah. So I'm there trying to start a two cruises pull up. I get out of the camera and I fall flat on my face drunk. And I go, either one of you guys got a set of cables so I can get out of here, right? And um, That's so, so funny. But what ended up happening was the sergeant, his son was working for me as a laborer, and he was best friends with the other sergeant. So he told the other police officer in the other car, a younger guy, he says, just take off and I'll take care of this. And the guy says, what do you mean? He goes, just get out of here because this guy was like a mean cop, you know. So I get in the, in the car with him. 
I'm bleeding and I'm starting to run my mouth. He said, hey, just shut the F up right. or I'm going to bring you to the station. So I get up there next morning. It was in the summertime. My blood is, my bed is covered in blood. I got to call the sergeant who I used his name. I had to walk down there. And that happened to me like four different times. Wow. So I could have easily had, you know, 10, right. 20, 100, 1,000 DUIs because that's how many times I drank. You know, and and you're lucky you knew someone. Right. And that happened like four times. Another wow. time was, and this is all in my 20s, it was Super Bowl Sunday. So we started drinking 10 o'clock in the morning. And I hung around with a tough crowd, you know what I mean? It's in the city, a lot of cocaine, a lot of, you know, everything. And so it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, I had been drinking for like 14 hours, 16 hours. And um, all of a sudden I get pulled over right in front of the police station like 2 o'clock in the morning. The guy comes up, he says, you know why I'm pulling you over? I go, I don't have any idea. He goes, you came around the corner. I was getting in my car. You almost hit me. Wow. I go, I'm good friends with so-and-so. Here's my license. He goes into his car. He comes back, throws the license in my face and says, okay, just drive home. Wow. But that was back in the, you know, right. the 80s when you could do that. Now I would have been arrested immediately. So I got off in my 20s at least four DUIs from situations like that. Wow. You know what I mean? So yeah. now... I'm 30 years old, right? I'm making $100,000 a year, and I'm broke every week. Never bought a new car, never bought a new house. My life was just drinking, doing cocaine, gambling, and just being a complete menace to society, being laid on my rent. You know, I'm making all this money, and it, it, I just didn't know anything else. It's all I knew. So now I'm 30 years old. I've been drinking alcoholically for 26 years, uh, for 16 years, wow. right? My whole 20s and my teens blacking out, just such hangovers because I would just mix the cocaine and the alcohol and not eat and go out and drink for 14, 16 hours. So people who know that, it just, it, it was funny, I was golfing today with th two sober guys and one who, did, who, did, who drank, right? And we golfed with this guy two weeks ago and he was hungover. And I says, and they were made a comment. I says, you know what? I haven't had a hangover in 13, over 13 years. Doesn't I love to hear when people have hangovers. Yeah, you know? isn't that great? Yeah, isn't you know? that great? Yeah. You know? And two weeks ago, he was all banged up, you know? And I'm like, and that's not even close to what I was. Yeah. So then in my 30s now, I'm still running these big union construction jobs. I got 20, 30 guys working for me. I'm drinking in the truck, you know, I'm coming in hungover on the weekends, I'm doing cocaine in the truck, and I'm just a menace to yeah. society, and I'm broke all the time, and I'm making huge money, and um, it just, it just, that's the way my life was. So now all of a sudden, I'm 40 years old now, and I've been drinking alcoholically and blacking out for 26 years. Wow. I mean, like, blacking out at least once a week for 20, for, you know, Holy. these last, yeah, and um, now I'm, uh, now it's, um, more hungover, I'm, you know, my life's getting more unmanageable. I'm more, you know, that progressiveness is now I'm drinking every single day. Yeah. And I'm 40 years old, you know, it's tough, you know? And um, this is where everything turned around. It was really bad then, but I, after I got sober, I put this on my timeline, I was 45 years old, uh -huh. you know? and I had met this woman, and I moved in with her, and we got, I was with her for one year, and we got pass out drunk every single night for a year. Holy. Every single night for one whole year. Did you even know her? Yeah, I, oh, I knew her for like a week before I moved in with her. But, but we were just like complete alcoholic buddies, you know. And she was, she was like an evil, this evil person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be with her for a day now. Right. But it was like my, you know, just that's the way it was. And so... Um, would you say that you maybe weren't so sweet either? No, or? I absolutely wasn't. Yeah, so it was but, toxic. But, 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 but I wasn't mean. I was just a drunk. Now, right. I'm, now I'm... So what ended up happening was... So I've been with this construction company as a boss for 10 years. I've been working construction now for 30 years, uh -huh. right? And um, I'm drinking all the time. So one, and I put this timeline together after I got sober. So we had, I was drinking after work and I passed out at like 10 and I woke up at like 2.30 in the morning. I remember it vividly. Yeah. And I woke up and I opened my eyes and she was passed out. I went downstairs. She always left a half a glass of wine. I had that half a glass of wine and two beers at 2.30 in the morning on a work night yeah. when I had to get up in three hours. And from that moment on, I was in a, a total obsession for three and a half years from that moment. I didn't go one second in three and a half years where I wasn't either drinking or thinking about it. Wow. That's a merciless obsession right there. So when they read this, you know, and the stuff in the big book, it's just amazing because it all pertains to me. You know, when they talk about that merciless obsession, I went three and a half years. And so now 
I've been with this company and now I'm starting to use prescription pills also. Okay. okay? So is this pain medication, stimulants, like what kind uh, of? Per perks. Okay. And oxys. So opiates. And, right. Whatever okay. it can get a hold Cause of. Because I was into, I wasn't into opiates. Opiates actually, and I, I thank God. Right. I did not like opiates. Right. Otherwise, this podcast, at least I wouldn't be on this right. podcast. Right. But, um, you know, for me, opiates made me itch and right. gave me an allergic reaction. Right. I was really lucky. Thank God. Yeah. I was literally <laughs> yeah. really lucky. So that allergy is real. <laughs> right. It, it is real. <laughs> it so, is. so so now I'm doing cocaine on the weekends, at least, and then I'm drinking every single day. And now I have a company truck and I'm in that obsession. And now I'm near the end of this job because I'm getting ready to get fired. How right? old are you? Sorry. I'm 45. 45. Okay. Right. So just ending with this woman, still with this I'm woman? I'm still with her, but okay. not for much longer. Okay. So now I'm in this merciless obsession. So this is how bad it is. So I would have a, a nice coffee on the way to work and I had the company truck. And the only thing I'm thinking about is that next drink. I mean, I am just obsessed. So bit, like as bad as you possibly can be. Yeah. So coffee time would come at nine o'clock and these, my crew would all have their coffee. I'd fly to the convenience store and I'd get two big bottles of Mike's Hard Lemonade or Smirnoff Ice and I would guzzle them down. It would take me the whole 20 minutes, bloated, you know what I mean? Oh. It was horrible. And so then I'm, now I'm back to you work. You really make me never want to drink again. <laughs> yeah. and it, it, gets, it gets a lot worse. Oh, this yeah. is just, this is, I still got a few more years. You know? well, well, go slow. We don't want to rush through. We still <laughs> want to hear it all. You'll hear it all and then okay. you'll hear about all that recovery. That's the I, amazing. Yes, thing, and you know? I want to hear all about that so, recovery too. So now, now I'm drink, drinking this. It's 9.30. Now all I'm thinking about is going out at lunchtime and getting a pint of vodka. Okay? Oh. So now... 11.45 comes, I sneak out, I go to the, the liquor store, we call it the package store in Massachusetts, mm. I get a pint of vodka and a, a Gatorade and I guzzle that down. Mm. I come back, I'm drunk, and I'm doing this and I'm, I'm, I'm on this condo job with two, 300 guys and I got 30 or 40 guys directly working for me. Are you running any cranes? No, or... I'm just like the labor foreman in charge of all the operators. And okay, so the foreman. Uh, the foreman in charge of all these guys, tell them what to do, how to do. Okay. And I'm coming back trashed every oh, day. Oh, they must you know? love you. And they all knew it, you know. Oh, yeah. But they were all my friends because I had been working with them for 10 years. Yeah. And that's going to be important in a couple seconds. So now what ends up happening, like maybe a, a month later, a new supervisor comes and he says, hey, you got to stop drinking, you know what I mean? We, yeah. we can't have this. And so I go out, so I'm still with the same woman. And that night before this happened, we went out and we, got, we ended up doing some cocaine and we stayed up all night on a work night, which I've done a hundred times before. Yeah. Not proud of, but just the fact, you know, because once you started, you can't stop. Oh, you trust know? me, I know. You I know? stayed out for days, forget right, overnight. Right. And, and so now I, so I get up and instead of getting that iced coffee, I made this big drink. Big vodka drink at the house. Drank it on the way in, right? Oh. Then at coffee time, instead of the Mike's Hard Lemonade, I went and got some more vodka, and then I'm in a blackout. Next morning, I pull up to the job. So now this is a picture of it. I'm pulling up to this big condo job, yeah. and all the guys used to stand around, and I pull up like the last minute. And as I pull up, the two big bosses from Boston are there, right? Yeah, right. That's the look I have, oh. right? I'm there. And now I'm wearing the cl same clothes as yesterday. Oh. I'm, I'm just a mess. Out of my pores is oozing that smell of a gutter drunk. Mm -hmm. And um, they go, hey, what happened yesterday, Brian? I go, I have no idea what you're talking about. At noontime, in charge of 40 guys, what happened yesterday at noontime? Well, there was a landscaper and he asked me to plant a tree. It used a backhoe to plant a tree. And I didn't like this guy because I was drunk. And I right. didn't like him anyway because I was so drunk at the time. <laughs> and I got out of my car and I grabbed a shovel and I threw it at him. Okay. I told him I was gonna F and kill him. And then I drove off the job. And I don't remember none of this. This is my coworkers I've been working with wow. for 10 years telling me this. So, but this is where, how bad the obsession was, right? So now I got the company truck. I'm getting a big Christmas bonus, two weeks vacation. They tell me, if you drink again on the job, we're going to let you go. Now, you've got to remember, for the last six months, I've been drinking at coffee time and lunch, coming in hungover and drinking until I pass out. Because yeah. I'm in that merciless obsession. Yeah. Only like six months into it, and I still got another three years. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that, that day, I didn't drink at coffee time or lunch, and man, did I need a drink after work, you know what I mean? So I got drunk. The next day, I go, I didn't drink at coffee time, but I drank at lunch. You know, because I'm in that merciless obsession. Nothing else matters but that next drink. Mm -hmm. My whole existence doesn't matter. 
All that matters is that next drink. Then the next day, I'm drinking a coffee time and lunch. And then a week later, they come, give me two, va two, two paychecks. I got to leave the company truck there. As humiliating as that was, and go around to these 20 guys I've been working with for 10 years, hey, they let me go, you know what I mean? And, um, and they all knew it was because I was a drunk, you know what I mean? It, it so sat you, you missed out on the vacation? Yep. On the bonus? And all of that. The pickup truck that I drove everywhere. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. I had had that truck for nine years. So are you back to the station wagon with the wood paneling? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that didn't get crashed. I know. Before. Just joking. But that, that's funny. I like that. <laughs> and I think about that. Every, and every time I went back to Massachusetts, every time I drove by that spot, I would think about it. So, no, no, I got a car, but it's nothing fancy. And I'm living with this crazy woman. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell her... I. I got laid off from a lack of work, and this is like the busiest company in New England, you know? Yeah. So I go down to the union hall, and I hadn't been to the union hall in 10 years. And I walk in, they go, what? and they, of course they had heard. I go, oh, they let me go because of a lack of work. And so on the ride there that morning, I, was, I needed to drink so bad, but I said, I can't drink going in there. So I go in there, I'm talking to the business agent, and he says, okay, just sign the slip, we'll sign the list, and we'll get you something. Because I was like really qualified as a site development supervisor right because that was a hard thing for laborers and i had been doing it for so long and i was really good at it but alcohol was more important so then that at that moment i remember it so now i'm driving it so i'm getting ready to leave i sign my name right mm -hmm. and as i'm walking out i look down and all it was was a scribble i could not even write my name wow i needed to drink so bad it was just like chicken like this chicken scratch chicken scratch you know so i get in the car i go Phew. I'm glad they couldn't see my name because I, I don't want to work. I just want to collect unemployment and drink, right? Yeah. Because I had been drinking, uh, working steady for 10 years, and I just went and got a pint of vodka. Because I drank them last three years was half pints, pints, nips, quarts. The smaller the bottle, the bigger the problem. That's what they say, and that was me. So now that relationship's almost over. Maybe another month goes by. And I'll tell you one story that happened with her. So now I lost a job. And I got this car, and um, I go out, and I get a quart of 100-proof Smirnoff. Uh -huh. And I guzzle it down in like a half hour, 45 minutes, and I'm uh. trashed. And I make a turn, and in Massachusetts, you got granite curb, and I blew the two tires out on the... You the, have, oh, grant a granite, curb? Granite, granite. Oh. Oh, granite. granite. Right. Yeah, okay. I talk funny. Well, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Normally I understand, yeah. but yeah, I didn't get that So one. granite curb, <laughs> and I made the corner, and I blew my two tires out, and her house was like, because I was living in her house, was like two miles away, yeah. it, and it just, it was like eight or nine o'clock at night, and I just drove like 30 miles an hour with two tires. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I would have got arrested. This town was really tough. Yeah. I didn't have the sergeant at my back anymore. That was, them days were gone. Yeah. And so I remember I got back to her house, and she was out. And I passed out on the floor. I peed my pants. And then all of a sudden, she's standing over me yelling like this monster. Ah! So <laughs> Pulling up to the job with the owners or having her standing her, over you. <laughs> I could handle the other. So, and, and I'm just, I'm hurting so much. I can't even talk, right? Yeah. It took me two days where I could even, before I could even go get them tires changed. So that relationship ended. Right. So then, um. I'm hopeless. You know, I'm hopeless. I'm drinking. Now that I've been out of work for a couple months, I'm just drinking around the clock. And I still got like three more years to do that. You know, I'm already possessing on my arm is all bruised from the poison trying to get out of my body from that wow. cheap vodka. And I'm, uh, now I'm just barely eating. Okay? Like, you know, when you see people with that red, red nose. That was me. And, and, and so a little further in the story, I'll tell you how bad it really got and why I have so much gratitude today and why I'm so vigilant with my program and why I help people, mm -hmm. why I think I'm a good fit for this podcast, to be yeah, honest with you. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're a great fit. You know? and, <laughs> and I call you Gratitude Brian. You're saved in my phone as yeah. Gratitude Brian. So many people have that. Because, you know, you, know, you are filled right. with so much gratitude. Well, and, and and now you understand why, you I know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so... And it's so, not even as at its worst. Right, so wow. now... It's time to come down to Florida. My mother's down here and my son's living down here. My son was in his 20s, early 20s. He had been down here for a few years and my mother had been down here for over a decade, yeah. right? And they hadn't seen me in a couple of years, but they had been hearing these phone calls of how this woman was in my life and they knew that I was in trouble, you know? So I leave Massachusetts, I crack a beer in the driveway and I drank the whole way. That's a long drive from Massachusetts to Florida, drunk the whole way. Wow. Yeah, honest to God. So 
I, get, I finally get down there, right? It takes me a couple days. You are a lucky man. <laughs> so I get to Florida. And everyone who came into contact with you is very lucky, Everybody, too. Yeah, yeah. So um, I got to, and, and everything I'm saying is 100% the truth. Yeah. And I'm probably, and I'm leaving a lot of stuff out because oh. there's no way I have enough time oh. to say everything. I leave things out all the time right. and I was drinking for half the time. Right. <sighs> so, so now I get to Florida. I meet my mother and son at the restaurant. I haven't seen them in a couple of years. And I, in that lap, before I came down, I had fallen out of bed a couple of times and I had two black and blues on my face from falling on my face out of bed. I got them bruises on my arms and my skin's starting to turn yellow. And I'm looking at them drinking a beer and they're just horrified. Their eyes are like this, like, yeah. what happened? And I still got a couple of years left. So then we have dinner and now I'm staying down there and um, I had some, a little bit of money and whatever. So that money ran out and I was in the union and I had, uh, quite a bit in an annuity. So what does that mean? Annuity, every hour I would work, they would put it into a special account. Okay. And then it's like a 401k. Okay. Like now it's $10 an hour they take out, but back then it was a couple hours. And I, so I had like $140,000 in there. And now I'm out of money. I got like a year and a half. I, I probably got another year to drink. Mm. I take that money out, right? I, I pay the taxes. I get a little under 100000 I buy a car for like 10 or 15 grand, and I got like 85,000. I went through that in nine months. Wow. But you know what? I never regret it because that got me to my rock bottom. So now, but well, you gotta put yourself in the position of my mother and son. I'm holding up in hotel rooms for three days, right? And how old are you? I'm 47. Oh my God. <laughs> and I don't it, know if that's worse than still living with your parents or. <laughs> right. So, well, I end up moving in with my mother because, I, you know, at the end. So, um, after that three day run, I'd look at my phone and there'd be a hundred messages because they thought I'd be dead. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and I'm just blowing through this money like it's going out of style, but whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So now we'll, we'll jump. So that went on for like a year. So now we'll jump to the, the last year of my drinking. Now I'm 48 years old. And I am destroyed from alcohol. I'm, I, I'm getting up in the morning, crawling into the bathroom and laying on the tiles to get the coldness from the tiles before I throw up yellow bile and go out and start drinking. Ugh. I did that for one full year. One full year. I would go to the liquor store that opened at like 8.30, the earliest one, and they would come and they'd open the, the light and I'd open the door to my car and I'd throw up, go and get a pint of vodka, one wow. throw up, two throw up, three drink and pass out, and that's all I did. You know, hit and runs, falling asleep at red lights. And it, I think this is a funny story. So my mother was working like three or four days a week. So when she wasn't working, I couldn't go back to the house because now I'm living with her that last year. So now I need a place to go. You know where I used to go around noontime when I was ready to pass out for uh -oh. the first time? I would go to Macy's and I'd sit in the furniture outside of Macy's with all the older guys oh and I'd pass God. out for, for like an hour or two, right? I thought you were gonna say an AA meeting. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't ready for that. So I would pass out and I'd wake up and I'd drool all over me and these old guys would be looking at me like, man, this and I, I, would, I did that for a while, you wow, know? Yeah. And I had, I had three hit and run accidents on military, hitting people at red lights at like five o'clock at night. I was just such a hopeless alcoholic. So now I got like six months before I stopped drinking, and my, my family didn't know about treatment or detox, so they sent me to a detox. And I remember this like it was yesterday, you know, and this is back in 2011. My mother driving me down to Fort Lauderdale. I'm drinking a pint of vodka. This will be the last time I ever drink, and I've just put my mother and son through three years of, of devastation. That yeah. last year, yeah. they're going to bed every night thinking I'm gonna die, you know, because I was a hopeless gutter drunk, yeah. you know, just, that last year, I couldn't eat more than a bite of food a day without throwing it up and just oh, drinking. It was yeah. awful. Yeah. That's why my body was shutting down. And um, so your body I, was living off that alcohol. Yeah, and that's why I had all them bruises. And I, now my skin's yellow. You know, I'm you know I'm pre-cirrhosis. You know, I'm just dying. Oh, you know, yeah. and and I'm miserable. I've been miserable for three years now. And um, I can't believe you lasted this it, long. So, so I mean, it, my, I I don't think I've cringed so it's, much. It's, it's, on it's, this. it's crazy. Ah. So then I um. So she brings me down there, and I remember I get out of the car. I'm a 48-year-old man, and I'm sitting on the steps in Fort Lauderdale crying because I didn't want to go in like a little baby Ugh. because I didn't, want, I, I, I didn't want to stop drinking, you know? So I go in there. They give me a breathalyzer. It's like .3 something. I got to sleep on the couch that night. And you know what? I was there for five days, and I ate a couple meals. 
I was sleeping. You know, that, before that, I couldn't even take a shower. I'd just stand in the shower and put a little shampoo in my hair and because I couldn't bend over, I'd fall over, you know? Yeah. And um, so I get out of there, I'm feeling good. Three hours later, I'm drinking vodka again. Oof. I hadn't had enough pain and suffering. I hadn't reached that gift of desperation, and I was just struggling so bad. So now I go on like another two-month run. So now, again, the family gets together. The decision is let's br bring them back to the detox again, and this time I'll go to a halfway house. I do that, go to the halfway house day two. Take a guess what happens. You start drinking. I start drinking oh again. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so, so now we're coming up. Now it's, we're talking probably January, February of 2011, and I'm just the, the biggest hopeless gutter drunk in America. What? I'm one of them original hundred. Oh, my God. I've been drinking now. I've been in a merciless obsession for over three years, right? Oh, my God. Imagine yeah. that. I, there was never a second. I would wake up at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning in a it's... fetal position crying because I needed a drink so bad. Oh, my so God. So then um, on March 28th, 2011. You must have been so suffering. Oh, it was. It, that's why I have so much gratitude. And, like, okay, I'll just get off this for one second. So I went to a meeting, like, a year ago. Yeah. And I had never been there before. And I shared, and this old timer with 40 years came up to me and he says, you had such a bad rock bottom drinking history because with that share, I know you did. Because I could tell. I go, yeah, I did. So now, March 28, 2011, I get up in the morning. I, I crawl on the floor. I'm laying in the bathroom. My pants are probably wet from the night. You know what I yeah. mean? I'm throwing up and I'm dying. You know, I'm just so miserable. Yeah. I'm just, I don't have much time left on this earth, you know? And, um, I want to cry almost. Yeah, well, but, but it get, it, it's getting ready. It's I starting know, to get good now. That's you know why I'm I mean? not crying. We're, we're, <laughs> at the end, we're at the end of the bad stuff, yeah. you know. So I um, go out, and I'm, I drink even more that morning. And I go back to my mother's house, and um, I fall flat on my face at noontime. I walk in, and I fall flat on my face. And she just starts bawling. She can't put up with it no more. We were supposed to go for my uncle's birthday. She goes, that's it, and she leaves. You can't come with us. So I call my son. He was 25 at the time. I said, Justin... I'll meet you at this pool hall in Boynton Beach at 4 o'clock. At 4.30, he comes outside. I'm inside my Buick LeSabre, comatose, drenched to the bone, and he can't wake me up. He thinks I'm dead. Mm -hmm. He's got to call the cops and ambulance, and he's got to help pull me out of that car. So the guy, the cop that came was a friend of his because he had been down here for a while. Okay. So the cop says, hey, why don't you bring his car home, and your mother can go to the hospital with him, and then you can meet him. My son takes the car to my mother's house, and all that vodka I was drinking and all them other things that I was drinking, I used to throw them on the back seat and have a beach towel over it. And it was up to the top of the seats with empties, right? Oh. And he filled up two of the biggest garbage bags you could have with empties. I said, oh, they would never know. I'm in Florida. Here's a beach towel. That's how delusional I was, you know? <laughs> and, when, and when I got out of treatment, I seen them. I go, oh, my God. Yeah. So, um, so now I get to the hospital. And his girlfriend at the time's mother was a real bad alcoholic. So that's how she told him, you got to Baker Act this guy. So my son Baker Acted me. I spent the, so then I was unconscious for like. So um, I just want to explain what a Baker Act okay. for someone who doesn't know what that is. Because we're in Florida and we have something called a Baker Act here, which means that when you Baker Act someone, you are basically committing them to a psych ward for two day, a two day hold, I believe it is two or three day hold, yeah. um, because because they might they're a danger to their own life, right. right? So I know in other states it's like a five hundred one or this and that. Right. I don't know, but yeah. you know, it, over here it's called the Baker Act, and that means you're going to the psych ward, right? And because I was suicidal, I didn't know it because I was killing myself drinking. Well, yeah, right. So I I come to after being unconscious for a few hours, and this is going to be important for this story in a little bit. So I come out. And I walk out of the thing, and I'm banged up, and I need a drink. And I look at my mother and son, and uh, like against that wall, and they're just bawling their eyes out, because I'm that hopeless gutter drunk who's there's no solution. I'm gonna die. Yeah. You know, they're 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 almost saying like they're lat, they're goodbyes. Right, right, That's how right. bad it is, you know. So um, they put me on suicide watch that night across from the nurses' station, and I'm just rocking and rolling. I need a drink so bad. They probably gave me a little something, but so then. In the morning, they come and they pick me up in a van and they bring me to St. Mary's Psych Hospital. And now I'm in the processing room. You know, I got a good memory of how much pain I, yeah. I was in. You yeah. Know? I'm on the couch in the fetal position for the last time. I had been in the fetal position for thousands, hundreds of times over the yeah. them last few years. I'm in the fetal position in this processing room. 
I'm throwing up, I got diarrhea, you know, I'm shivering, I'm sweating. All of it at once. All at once. And then the, the nurse who was in charge comes out and she looks at me, she goes, oh my God, you look horrible. She just couldn't help it, it came out. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how bad I look, right? Yeah. So it sounds I go, like I'd be like that nurse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I go, up, they, I go upstairs, they, they start to detox me, and I spend four, three or four nights there. Yeah. And now I'm feeling okay. Another van comes and gets me and it brings me to treatment for 28 days. I go in that treatment day, the first day, they're all younger, you know, like, oh, it, it's, know. It, it's like 50 people and it's like five alcoholics and the rest and they're, and they're all messing around and I'm like pissed off. Wait, but then at this point in the end, you're just drinking alcohol. You're not doing any perks and stuff. No, no. no Cause you no. can't afford it. You can yeah, only afford no, alcohol. No, I was just, yeah. So, um, and maybe I'll have time to tell this l a little later on in the story, you know? Yeah. So then, um, so I go in, that first week's horrible. You know, I'm in such bad shape. I can't even walk from here to the, to the door yeah. without taking a break. I remember they, at the detox at the treatment center when they brought me there from the psych hospital, there was a basketball hoop and I shot the basketball and I couldn't even reach the net. That's yeah. how bad I was. Oh you know? God, that's yeah. like me. And, and then I That's start like me today. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, I started eating a little bit. You know, that first two weeks, I'm still going back to Boston. I'm still gonna get that union job. I'm gonna get an old girlfriend. Oh, and, and but listen, that's so, like me in my apartment. Right. I'm gonna decorate it <laughs> yeah. in my with my arrow right. bed with right. a hole in it. Yeah. So so now I'm on that my final voyage. If I go back, I'm not coming back. Right. I'm gonna drink myself to death. And then on like week three, I um decided to stay. You know, I was so angry in that treatment center. I just was so miserable. And, you know, but I'm starting to be a little better. You know, I haven't drank in like four or five weeks now. So I get out of there, and they kept on saying, go to a meeting, go to a meeting. And now this is where the miracle starts. So I think I qualify as an alcoholic. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I never understood this qualify thing. You know, yeah. if you're an alcoholic and you say right. so, yeah. well, I believe you. Right. You so, know, I... Right. So, um... So now they kept on saying, go to a meeting, go to a meeting. So I look it up and there's the 7 a.m. meeting. I don't know if I can say where it is or whatever here. You can say whatever you so, want. So it's at Crossroads, 7 a.m. in Delray. And it's my home group today, one day at a time. It has been for the it's whole- It's an amazing place. The whole 13 plus years I've been going there on yeah. a regular basis, you wow. know? So, and remember I said how miserable I was for three and a half years. I wasn't happy one day. So I walked in this meeting and I'm just getting out. And remember, the two times I was in detox, I went out drinking right away. So if I didn't go to the right meeting and I drank again, I wouldn't be alive today. So I'm walking down this meeting, and it happened to be the last Friday of the month. Oh, and it was anniversary. anniversaries. Okay. <laughs> so That's I'm always a hopeful place to right. be. So I'm walking down the hallway, and I hear all this chatter and noise. I'm there like, what's going on in there, you know? And it's like 10 minutes to seven, quarter of. And I walk in, there's already like 80 people in there, right? Yeah, at like it's a big quarter, meeting. Quarter of seven. And there's 14 people receiving medallions, so it's an hour of joy and happiness and recovery. So I sit near the back of the room, and then from 10 minutes of seven to seven o'clock, 150 people pile into this room. Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sponsors, everybody's dressed up, they're hugging, they're happy. Nothing that, that was all foreign to me. I right. didn't know nothing about none of this. Right. right? And, I'm, and I'm sitting there, and I'm there like, wow, this is pretty amazing, you know? And on, the first woman gets up, she's like 22 years old, and she picks up a one-year medallion. Her mother and father are there, and her sponsor. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then a guy the same age. But what was even more important was what happened after them two. A 50-year-old guy picked up a medallion for a year. Yeah. That gave me hope. And that gave me a solution right there, right? Which I really needed so badly. Well, so many people think that like, oh, well, he's 50. What is he going to do now? You right. know, like, uh, you know, I have, I have a friend and he's in his 40s. And I always tell his parents, I'm like, you know, he can still get help. Ah, no, you know, he's in his 40s. Right. He'll never, he, he, it's over for him. And right. I'm like, it's not. Right. I know people in their 60s, in their 70s who and then they have the best years of their right. lives you I've, know i've just had the best 13 years of my life right now, i can imagine yeah. i've had the best years of right. my life you know and, and so um he picks up the year and then there's after that there's 11 more people 
So there's an hour of joy and happiness. It turned out to be the second best day of my life besides my son being born. Oh. That meeting saved my life. Yeah. So I walked out of there and I had like this little feeling like maybe someday I can have what these people have, right? Yeah. You know, I'm remembering this like it was yesterday. It was almost, it was over 13 years ago. I remember my ago. first yeah. meeting yeah. at Cross, yeah. well, second meeting, I should right. say. First AA meeting at Crossroads. It was a 7 a.m., you know, one day at a time right. meeting, and I felt the same way. Right. It was amazing. At first, I was like, who are these people? Right. And then my second thought was like, okay, I kind of right. like that. Yeah. And, and I was fortunate because it was the anniversary meeting. Yeah. So I went back the next day, and I raised my hand. I said, I'm Brian. I need help. And like 15 guys came and helped me. Yeah. I got a sponsor. Yeah. I started doing my steps. And that first three months of my sobriety, at 48, almost 49 years old, the first three months, I was going to like three meetings a day, carrying around a big book. And every day was getting better. Then all of a sudden, I picked up a 30-day chip. And I hadn't gone 30 days since I was 14 years old. 34 yeah. years it took me to get 30 and, days. And you had more days, really, because four right. to five weeks you were right. in treatment. Right. So, so you had uh, yeah, it more was, time. Right. It was like six weeks. But yeah. I picked up a 30-day. And then I picked up the 90-day. And that was a real 90-day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember, you know, I just remember like it was yesterday. It was, I was like on cloud nine. That's awesome. And when you think about it, 90 days without a drink, in most of society, that ain't a big deal. But when you go 34 years without even coming close to it. Yeah. And then, so what, what ended For up any alcoholic, that's an right. incredible. That's incredible. Right. So what was amazing was um, that, so then after like four months, I had to, do, I had to humble myself, right? And I, got a, I had to get a job. And I couldn't go back to Mass and get that big union job, making 40, 50 bucks an hour. Get another girlfriend because I wouldn't have made it. You know what I mean? I needed, to I stay. needed, I needed everything. So I listened to what it said in the big book, what everybody told me, and I got a job at the Palm Beach Kennel Club cleaning dog kennels and landscaping when nobody spoke English for twelve bucks an hour. I humbled myself. Yeah. I remember I was working out picking weeds. You know. You must and, have been like, were you miserable or no, were you I, happy? I was happy of because course, every day you miserable. I was I was working seven to three thirty and going to a five thirty meeting, yeah. right? And it was great. And then. All these coin, and now I'm still in the first six months, and I'm not over analyzing nothing. I'm just keeping it really simple. I'm going to meetings every day. I changed everything, and life is getting better. I'm, I'm not even into that. I'm just, I know something's helping me, but I don't know what. Okay. Yeah. So, um, then I, I met the business agent for the labor's union down here at a double speaker meeting at like five months sober, and I got in the labor's union down here because they were doing the nuclear power plants over. And so I wouldn't suggest it for a lot of people, but I ended up at six months. I started to work six days a week, 12 hours a day. Right. But this is the, so it was up in Stewart. I was living in Jensen Beach uh -huh. and I was working at the nuclear power plant. And this was my schedule for five months. Six days a week, I would get up at four o'clock in the morning, do my little prayers and everything, go to work, get out of work and go to a seven o'clock meeting. So I was getting up at four in the morning and I went to a seven o'clock meeting every single night, never missed one, wow. okay? So you did a morning meeting and an evening? No, not a, no, oh. because I was signing oh, at six o'clock in the morning. Right, right, right. I was working six, but yeah. I was doing my prayers and thanking God, you know? Your prayers. Yeah, my prayers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, um, and then people would say to me, you're falling asleep in the meeting. Look at, you're exhausted. I go, listen, I haven't missed a meeting, and I haven't drank in seven months. I'm going to keep on doing this, right? And it was funny because I travel for work for quite a while if I have time. I to remember when I first met you, you were traveling right. for work. And um, they had a sign at this. It was Fellowship Hall in downtown Stewart, right at the Circle, a nice downtown. They used to have that Fellowship Hall. It was an older place. And behind the desk, it said a big sign, the more I miss meetings, the more I miss drinking. So I'd be sitting there, and I'd be exhausted. I'd look up at that sign. i go, damn right. I'm not missing drinking and I'm not missing meetings. I'm going to keep on coming every single day. Yeah. So I didn't miss a meeting for my first three years, working them hours, you know? Yeah. So we'll jump forward to my one year anniversary, right? Now, this is amazing. This is an amazing day. Look right? how happy you yeah, are. You know? I mean, you can't make this up. Right. You can't. And yeah. so now all these people that were at this, you know, because that morning meeting, there's 100 people there every day back then. Yeah. And, and there's, st I mean, and there still, still is. A it's a full house. It's a full so house. all these people see the miracle because I was so banged up when I came in yeah. and they heard from my shares. Now everybody in the room is, you know, excited yeah. for me to get up there, you know? Yeah. And um, so my sponsor, Jim, had all these things he wanted to say. And I remember he broke down because of that emotional bond. I know bond. your sponsor. Right. <laughs> that emotional bond. The miracle of me being alive still. And so now I'm standing up there with the medallion. And I look down at it. And I look at this full house. 
and like the first four ro- rows opened up, and there was my mother and son, oh. bawling their eyes out oh. with joy, tears of joy and happiness, right? Yeah. And I looked at them. Remember a year earlier when they were in that emergency room thinking I was going to die that night? Now a year later. And I looked at them, and as they were crying, they were smiling, and I could see how truly happy they were. They were as grateful for AA as I was in a fellowship, you know? And I looked at them, and I looked down at that medallion, and I said, if I didn't find this meeting in AA, they would have been sitting at my funeral before this day. That's what I thought. And I go, what a blessed gift. And so then, for my mother, she went to my anniversary meeting every year for the first seven years. And then I was working up in Pennsylvania, and she got diagnosed with some real bad stuff. I came down, took a week off of work, mm-hmm. and then I ended up staying down here. And she only had under six months left. And a gift of the program was she never had to be alone. I was with her every day. We did hospice at the house. And every day, she would be there in her, her, her recliner with her little thing and my seven medallions on her little stand oh, with the lamp. That. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, every, and the, th- the thing is, is... People don't understand how important um, recovery in A is for families, right? So this woman went seven years where she didn't have to wake up every morning crying because her son died an alcoholic death. Yeah. And when she ended up passing away way too young, she went on her terms, you know, and she didn't lose any sons before it, you know? Right. And then on the other hand, my son, he's going to be 39 in August. And we've been best friends for the last 13 years. He hasn't t- had to tell everybody that comes in his life his father died an alcoholic death. Yeah. So my son and mother is grateful for AA as yeah. I am, That's you know? That's amazing. And so that was a pretty, you know, a pretty good first year, you know? And your son doesn't have any, um, any ad- issues with addiction or anything? No, you know, yeah. he, he's drank in the past, but, he, yeah. you know, he's been in the program. And he oh, do- he's in the program? Yeah, so he d- he's doing well, you know oh, what I mean? okay. But he has his own program, you I know? I wasn't sure if, yeah, of course, of right. course. So, you know, and that, and that works for both of us, you know? And he's in real estate down here. He's doing great. And um, just, you know, just think how hard life would be, you know? It, and it would have been already yeah. 13 years. I wouldn't have been around because I would have never made a, a year. When, when I went into um, treatment and they looked at my numbers from the hospital, they go, how are you still alive? You That's know? what they said to me. Yeah. I needed a, a blood transfusion right. and detox. Yeah. And they were just like, what have you been living on? Right. Like, what, you know, my skin was gray. Right. Yeah, so pretty similar, you know. Yeah. Just, and um, that's like in Except the... Except mine was not as many years as you. Right. I can't believe you went so long. It, yeah, it's, it's crazy. That's I can't it, believe it either. That's you know? incredible. And, and, and when they say in um, the big book, you know, this book is about the first 100 low bought, you know, I could have easily been one of them original 100. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. not proud of it. It's just a fact. Right. I could have a story in the back of that book on me. Oh, for sure, you know, you know, for sure. And because of the miracle of my recovery and how good it is and how many thousands of people I've helped. Yeah. Like now I go into the morning meeting and I shake everybody's hand and I remember their names. And I go, hey, you're looking great, you know. When but, I go and I don't get to see you, I texted you last time. I'm like, I ran out, but, you know, I, I wanted to right, say bye, right. you know, I, yeah. because, because I feel like you are uh a pillar and and someone who helped me right. so much you and, know? and i appreciate that and i appreciate you asking me to come today and i remember like we were talking about when i first got here i w- i think it was still like like around a year sobriety or something and um maybe not maybe yeah but i spoke at a meeting that i had never been oh, before yeah, yeah and i'm i get in there and i don't know anybody then right before the meeting sits, starts i see you there with this big smile on right. your face you were like so happy right yeah and, yeah and i remember when i was done sharing you had this great share and that's like the gift of the program i've seen so many people under 13 years like how much time do you have now so it'll be eight years. And you look so much better now. Oh, eight my years God. Later. Thank you. And, and so the miracle of the program. And it just makes, makes me so happy to see that. And, like, when you go get your medallion, it's like, I remember her when she was struggling. Yeah. And, and I, I know thousands of people like that. And so I'll, I'll just get back to the story real quick. No, so, please. You have, we, we're not rushing. Okay. I don't want you to feel oh, rushed no, no. in any way. No, so, I, you know, I, got thir- I, I kind of wrapped up the 34 years pretty good. Now I got 13 years of sobriety yeah. to talk about. So the first three years, I was up. And, and I st- love just to say that you're outlining it because I really tell people, tell me what the first few years like, and for you, I guess those middle years and what you do now because those first years of sobriety are very different from 
what you're doing now, right. I'm sure. Right. But but it's I'm still doing the same things my first year, but it is one hundred percent different. Right, of course. Right. So um so I was up in Stewart and then down in Homestead all the way down south, there's a nuclear power plant down there. So I went back and forth for two years to the two places. So I had like two home groups down in Homestead, two in Stewart, and two in Del Rey. So I, I had six home groups. Were you voting in all of them? You're not supposed to. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Okay. <laughs> but I, I called them my home groups because I yeah. went all the time. Right, of course. You know, and, I was, just and, and I'm still going to meetings all the time. And um, so, after, so then all of a sudden, the work ended, right? So now I got three years of sobriety under my belt. And there's no more work in the union. And I got like 20 years, a little over 20 years in the union. So now I'm going to transfer back up to Mass. And I'm going to travel for work six months a year. And I'm going to live down here for six months a year. Yeah. And, can, and now make a lot more money and get benefits and be able to retire when it comes time. Right. And I just retired a year and a half ago with 30 years in the union mm -hmm. where I wouldn't even been alive. You know what I mean? And Amazing. what a blessing, you know? Yeah. So what happened was on January 28th, 2014, the day before my three-year anniversary, I, had to, I was driving to Moline, Illinois. And this is an amazing story. I don't care what anybody says. I've told it a million times. I still have the same car I almost died in, that Buick LeSabre, right? Okay. And I had a big dent in the front from a blackout that I never fixed for three years. It was like a badge of courage. I'm not fixing that because I don't ever want it to happen you again. You still have it today? No, I don't have oh, it anymore. Oh, at that time. Three I was years. like, wow, that no, car is really... No, three... I had, <laughs> so, it, so three years. So now I got to drive to Moline, Illinois, and it's a two-day ride by myself in the car I almost died in. But now the difference is, three years earlier, when I was driving around in that car at the end, out of my pores was oozing that smell of a gutter drunk. Mm. People say... it. So there's nothing worse than that smell. Like somebody laying in the, the, the gutter, that's what I smell like. Mm. Honestly, you know, yeah, that's just yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm dry and miserable. So now three years later, I've done everything perfectly as I could in AA. I've gone to a meeting every day. I've sponsored guys. I've spoken at all these treatment centers, detoxes, wherever. And I still do the same thing today. Mm -hmm. I've spoken over a thousand times. Easy. Yeah. Everywhere. Right. You know, I never say no. And, um. So I'm driving in that car for two days on the last day of my drink and three years later and on my anniversary date. And the whole time out of my pores is oozing gratitude. Does that make sense? Yes, you know what I mean? it does. I was just like happy the whole time yeah. because I'm going on a new adventure. I was in my comfort zone for three years. Now I got to go tr test out AA around the world, right? around the country. Yeah. And so I get to Moline, Illinois on like a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and it's my anniversary, my three-year day. Th thing so I find it was before the meeting guide app and all that so yeah. I find this meeting I already had it lined up before I left Florida and I get there and it's like in the inner city and this mole in Illinois is like a tough thing so I, it's a really gritty meeting there's homeless people there's drug addicts there's alcoholics there's right. like a hundred people at this 530 meeting a bunch of people picking up chips and I felt just right at home. I felt like this is where I belong, you know? Yeah. And then they say, is it anybody's anniversary today at the beginning of the meeting? And I raised my hand. I said, today's three years. Now, this is the first time I haven't been at Crossroads right. for my meeting. And um, I'm just trying this new thing on the road. And so um, I shared for like 30 seconds or a minute. And then I just really listened to all the speakers. When the meeting was over, they gave me a card. Everybody in there signed it, right? Oh, I love that. And then they and gave I, me- And I bet I can guess what you said for well, your 30 seconds. Every morning, I start my morning <laughs> with gratitude. I, I, have, I haven't said it yet. You took it away from me. Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. So, so um, and then they gave me a medallion. Yeah. A three-year medallion. Yeah. No, this is, I, usually I start all my shares with, I woke up this morning, and when I opened my eyes, I thank God I didn't want to drink. Yeah. I wasn't in the fetal position crying like I talked about for three years. So every day when I wake up, I'm truly grateful that I don't want to drink. Yeah. And I thank God for that because he's the one who lifted that obsession. Yeah. 100%. And then what am I going to do to help another sick and suffering alcoholic? And how am I going to make my sobriety the most important thing? And then at the end of the day, I put my head on the pillow, usually about 8.30, 9 o'clock nowadays, yeah. that I'm in my 60s, you know. <laughs> and that's a, that's a miracle I'm in my 60s, you know. Yeah. And, um, and I, I say, thank you, God. And I put my head on the pillow and I sleep like a baby. Yeah. I'm sleeping in a minute. 
I, you I, must be the most grateful person I know. I'm so grateful yeah. all the time. Yeah. And they call me Gratitude Brian all over the country, you know, right. and I never introduce myself that way because I always share gratitude and enthusiasm because the newcomer needs to hear that. Yeah. That there's happiness in this thing, you know? And that was, and, and you know, that was the biggest thing when I, I remember when I was sitting on my porch in treatment center and I was like, how am I going to be happy? How am I going to live? Like, what's life going to look like? Right. You know, you, you, yes, I wanted to n stop drinking and, and, and stop doing drugs. But I was like, what? Wait. Right. You know, wait a minute. You yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> excuse yeah. me. How am I going to live? Right. And I think now, now my thought is, how was I living? Right. Which I wasn't. Right. I was surviving, you know, I, w I always talk about how I was like this hollow person. I would like walk and drive through New York as if like I was a ghost, right? you know, yeah. because I was, right. I was like this like gray ghost. Yeah. And disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. Oh my so God. So bad. So bad. I, I mean, I would check my debit card because I only ate once a week. So I had to right. figure out when, when was the last time I right. ate. Yeah. And like, like I said, that last year, my, I'd eat one bite of food and throw it up. That's all I could do all yeah. day. You know? Imagine, imagine. Horrible. I couldn't, I couldn't shower, you know and what I mean? It's so important, and that's why this is so important, is because, you know, some people, are, some people think of alcoholics as just homeless people, or right. as just, you know, and it's like, no, like, you were a union guy, you grew right. up in a good family, yeah. you grew up well, yeah. you know, but look, you know, you know, Alcohol is insidious. Like 34 years is a long run. You right. Know what I mean, that's right. not no kid it, it, stuff. You know? Alcohol and drugs do not discriminate. Right. They do not discriminate. Right. They don't care how rich, poor, you know, color, you know, not color, right. gender, no gender, you know, white, da, 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 nothing. I've, I've seen it's so many different people. And another thing is, is, um, you know, and I'll, then I'll continue with, on that chronological order, Please. you know, is, um, all these treatment centers and detoxes and all these meetings I've gone to, all the people I've seen relapse, right? Yeah. Some of them die because yeah. it's dangerous out there now with the yeah. drugs. Uh. And, um, but there's, there's a, a recurring event happens. They stop making their sobriety the most important thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? They stop going to meetings. Right. They stop talking to other alcoholics. Right. It happens 99.9% .9 of the time. You know, they stop, they stop, they go from seven to five to one to one every two but weeks. But also stopping the, you know, not just meetings, because I think that there's so many people who never went to meetings right. who are sober, right. but they make their sobriety right. so right. important. The, the, however you do that, you yeah. stop doing that. Right. So, so it's, it's more than just that. It's like they stop connecting with people. Right. Right? They start make, they start calling other alcoholics. Right. To see what's going on with somebody who's doing good. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, um, and, and or then, not doing good. And, and then what happens is also these people who relapse, they're out there for six months, a year, two years, five years. They die. They're out there 10 years. I remember I spoke, and so, I have so many good memories about me speaking at treatment centers and detoxes because I remember I, I, was, I went to BHOP, and I used to speak there like every six weeks for like three years. Mm -hmm. And I would sit there and I'd say, hey, I was in, this exact, in the same seat as you guys are. And this is, you know, now this is where I'm at. And um, so, like, at the end of the meeting, like, five or ten people would stay and talk, and the other people would go. And I remember there was a line of, like, ten people one time. And um, at the end of the line, there was a woman. She was, like, 70 years old, yeah. right? And um, everybody had left the room. I go, hey, how you doing? She came up and hugged me and started bawling her eyes out. She goes, I finally think I got a chance after hearing your story. I drank just like you, and I just... I never thought I there'd be a solution, and now I heard what you said, and you know, hopefully she made it. But yeah. you know, and I got hundreds of things like that. So you know, I mean, helping another someone who who's either alcoholic or a drug addict or whatever it is, you know, helping someone who needs uh, recovery is is kind of the best thing. Ever. Right. You right. know, it feels good. It. Uh, you know, it does something for you. Right. It and, does something for and you. And so what ended up happening on my travels? So. For eight years, I traveled. Arkansas, Iowa, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, you know, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And I went to meetings at all these places, right? So I would go into this. I remember I went into this meeting in New Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. And especially me, I'm so loud and enthusiastic and grateful, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, most people aren't like me, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I'm not saying people don't feel like me, but I really, 
get carried away sometimes, yeah. you know. In but, a great way. But so many people say, hey, man, I remember you. You used to fire me up, you yeah. know? And so I go to this meeting in New Jersey, and it was the first day. I was going to be there for like five months. And um, it was a 5.30 meeting, and at the end, I shared. And I was sitting in the back of the room, and everybody's turning around like, who is this guy? You know what I mean? And like, I could see people smiling. People come up to me after. Yeah. Man, thanks. I needed that. I needed that, you know? Yeah. I've been hearing these same people. It's so nice, you know? And so there was a woman in that meeting, and um, for the first month I was there, she was doing great, you know, became a little bit of friends. Then I didn't see her for like a month. Then after that month, at the end, when everybody used to hold hands, and she, I'm holding her hand, and she's shaking. I go, what I, I, what's wrong? She goes, I can't stop drinking. She was a school teacher. She goes, my kids aren't talking to me. My husband's not talking to me. I'm in trouble at school. I go, let's go talk outside. I went out and talked with her for like 10 or 15 minutes. I said, can you go the rest of the day without drinking, and I'll meet you here tomorrow. We did that like every day for a week. Yeah. Talked with her 10, 15 minutes. I mean, hey, I was where you were. And... Then all of a sudden, she just started coming to the meetings. We weren't talking after the meeting. And then it was my last day in town. And um, she walks in the room. Her eyes are like this. She got this huge smile on her face, right? Yeah. I go, what's going on? She comes up and she hugs me and almost squeezes the air out of me. She goes, I got three months today. Everything's so good, you know? Yeah. I'm not saying I had anything to do with it, but, but it didn't have, hurt, you yeah, know what I mean? No. And she was just so happy that I took the time to talk to her. But you did have something to do with that, and it's okay to say that. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, did. Yeah, Come you on. know what I mean? But so it made and me feel good. And you help people so much, uh, you know, not only in your energy, but with your stories, with, with the knowledge you have of, right. hey, like, can you not drink tonight? Come back tomorrow. Like, you right. almost know how to, like, like, um, T explain to them how it works right, type of right. thing. Uh, yeah, know? and, and, and I, you know, and I walk in and people respect my program and the newcomers are like, man, you know, they come up to me and they shake, you know, I shake their hand and I just become friends with everybody. Yeah. And so another story, which I think is really good if you yes. don't mind me telling you this one. No, not so, at all. So, then, so this one, so now I'm back in Massachusetts and I'm up in this, this meeting right outside of Worcester where I'm yeah. from. And I'm, I'm going to this meeting for like three or four years. You know, it's a great meeting. Yeah. When COVID was going on, they, they were having a meeting with no masks, right? In the right. middle oh of COVID. God, yeah. They didn't care. Yeah. I go, okay, I'll go. So, Florida. <laughs> so, so right before I left, I told the story. When I was down here, at, near the end of my drinking, my car, the motor was gone in my car. And um, I didn't have any money for like a week. My mother had gone away and she was holding my money, you know. And I needed a drink so bad. So it took me like two hours to find enough change to get a pint of vodka. Right. Looking in the car, under the cushions, dimes, nickel. I find a quarter. I'm so happy. Right. 48 years old, you know. So now the problem is I got all this change. I got to walk a mile, a mile and a half to the pack, to the liquor store. Right. In the middle of the heat in such bad oh. shape. I get there. I drink the thing outside the, the, the store. I pass out halfway home. Then I get back there, and now I got no more change. I got to just suffer through two days of pain. Yeah. And so, like, a year later, I come back to the same meeting, and the guy raises his hand, a younger guy, probably like 30. He goes, I just want to thank the grateful guy they called me there. Not, okay. <laughs> it was the grateful guy. Yeah. I want to thank the grateful guy because a year ago today, Today's my anniversary. A year ago today, when the meeting was going to be over, I was going to go out and find crack in the seats of my cushions of my car. And he told this story, right. and I didn't, and I'm picking up a year today. That's awesome. You know, how your story can help yeah, somebody. Absolutely. You know, You know what I mean? Right there, this and guy. I yes, you know, exactly. That's ex you know? Right. And then I'll tell you one more of helping people. So Because I um, want to ask you something afterwards. Okay, this will be my last story. <laughs> but I, I could tell you a hundred of them I helping know, people. I know, I so know. So the last time I'm traveling for work, I'm in Wisconsin. Yeah. And it's in the wintertime, and it's dreary. And this meeting I was going to, they were bringing this, these people in from this treatment center. They had 15 beds, and they, these people were off the street. Yeah. You know, drug addicts, just low bottom, you know? Yeah. And so I spoke at a Saturday night at a speaker meeting, and this girl came up to me at the end of the meeting. She was like 29 years old. She was missing some teeth. She said, this is my first AA meeting ever. I haven't seen my three kids in a while, and, you know, I just really appreciate your message. So, like, four days later, I go into that meeting where they, they used to go, but I hadn't seen her before because the first time was at that yeah. speaker meeting. 
I walk in and she's sitting with like three friends and she sees me walk in the door. She jumps up. She comes running over to me. She goes, Brian, I got five days today. I just want to let you know I'm just, everything's so good, right? Yeah. You know? You're like, so oh, this, this is just the beginning. Yeah, this girl was just so hopeless a week ago. Yeah. And so I went into that meeting like five or six different times. And every time she would jump up and tell me her day count. Yeah. So it's the last day I'm in town again. It seems like always something happened the last yeah. day. Yeah. And it was a, a rotten day, you know. And um, she's been in treatment now for a month or something. And I pull up next to the van and she gets out. She goes, I wanted to use all day today. And the people told me, this is the day you really got to go to a meeting. And then I seen you and I knew I did the right thing by coming to this meeting. Oh, you know? I love you know that. I mean? So now I have a question. If, I yeah. could, if you could tell your younger self something, you tell me what age it would be, right? What do you picture in your mind when you're having this conversation with your younger self? And what would you say? Yeah, you know, um, that, that's, a, that's a challenging question, you know, because... And, and, you know, it would have been right off the bat, you know what I mean? Because I started the whole time I was like that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, you know, my whole life. So, but what the secret I think is, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because I came in when I did. Right. So like all these people I talk to and the people that my sponsors and everything, I tell them, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. You're just looking forward one day at a time. I can't look back and say, hey, I should have two houses. I should have a oh, million right. dollars in the bank. You know, it, I would have stopped right the first day I drank. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? So, you know, it, it's just, you know, I, I would have probably still been married. You know yeah. what I mean? I would have had other kids. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I would have had all this stuff, but yeah. none, none of that matters. So what happens is I do everything one day at a time, including resentment. So anything happens bad today. I leave it in today. Yeah. And I start fresh every day. Every morning I wake up, I'm waking up, and people go, I don't wake up like that. I go, well, that's great, but I do. Right. You know, I'm yeah. grateful every day I wake up and I'm alive and I don't need a drink. I'm not in that obsession anymore. Amazing. But the other thing is, I'm always one drink away from that obsession. So by me coming over here on the holiday weekend, this is what I need. Yeah. And hopefully some people that are watching this are going to say, wow, this is pretty cool. And this I guy's really, it. this guy's really enthusiastic about his sobriety. You are. And I'm, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much You're for welcome. coming. And I know that this will help people. And, um, I'm just so grateful to you. And I want to congratulate you on your beautiful sobriety and giving back doing this podcast. Thank That's you. That's fantastic. We you know, love it. And, and Corey loves it. And, you know, we're doing our best. We yeah, it's fantastic. All right. Well, give me a hug. You made my day. Mm -hmm.